Uh, but I wanted to start with, I suppose, a bit of an introduction to the struggle in Rojava, especially mm. from, from your perspective. You've been someone who's been following this for a while now. A few years. Um, a few yeah. years, yeah. So I, I wonder if you could explain, I suppose, to the audience why you've been so interested in what's going on there and a bit of background to, I suppose, why, why do the left mm. follow what's going on there? Well, I mean, this is one of the most exciting political experiments really since the anarchists in Spain in the 1930s. This is one of the few occasions when people have actually had a extensive uh, stretch of territory in which to try to see if libertarian socialist ideas can really be put into practice and actually work on the ground um, with a lot of really startling success, to be honest. Um, I first found out about the revolution and Rojava and people there contacted me. Um, and, you know, at first I think everyone reacted with a certain degree of incredulity. I mean, is this really true? Could this be happening? Could all of this been happening for all these years and I'd never heard about it? But, um, you know, the more I learned, the more I was really struck by how profound an historical experiment it really was. In what way? So, so in what, what well, what okay. Mean? I mean, what we're talking about is really something that started within the PKK, which is the guerrilla movement, and it's a larger political movement within Turkey, uh, which is originally a separate Marxist-Leninist separatist movement. Um, over time, it has evolved, and often this is attributed you know, almost exclusively to the personality of one person, the sort of head of the PKK, Abdullah Ocalan. Although, in fact, a lot of what happened within the PKK was the result of internal struggle, especially women's struggle within uh, the organization itself. Um, uh, what Ocalan has to be to his credit is that he was open to it, which mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, these sort of old patriarchal Marxist Leninist types are not. Um, and gradually over time, PKK transformed from relatively traditional national liberation struggle uh, to was pushing for a separate Kurdish state uh, to something really different. Um, a group whose major planks are eco social ecology, a lot of it inspired by Murray Bookchin, um, although they have their own version of democratic mm. confederalism that they've developed, uh, partly based on their own experience, partly on Kurdish traditions, and partly based on anarchist theory. Um, and um, so you have social ecology, direct democracy, and women's liberation being the sort of primary uh, planks of a social struggle, which no longer actually desires a separate state at all, in fact, sees itself as in essential opposition to the very idea of a state. This is something which we haven't seen anything really like it happen in many years. I mean, there's the Zapatistas, this is the closest parallel one can think of, but even the Zapatistas don't really control a contiguous territory, whereas these people actually do. And there's been, I suppose, mm -hmm. what could seem a, a somewhat bizarre or strange mm -hmm. or unlikely alliance mm -hmm. between this movement in Rojava, liberationary, mm -hmm. libertarian socialist, and the United States. So it, yeah. was, it was the combination of those two forces that was capable of defeating ISIS since since 2014 it's, and it is protection from United States from the United States it's protected Rojava from other enemies well Turkey yeah. which is what we'll get on to in a moment um if I if you want me to do the background I can um well, there's a PKK originally that had this um profound transformation what happened in Syria was um PYD uh it was a political party with very similar ideology also follows um idea you know, the writings of Ojalan and whatnot, um, they're not directly connected. Um, but during the Syrian revolution, essentially, the Syrian government pulled out of that area. Uh, it had been very strongly organized, the Kurdish parts of, of Syria. And um, negotiations ensued, and they basically talked the Syrian forces into just um, pulling out and leaving people there to handle their own affairs. Um, I mean, they took everything when they left. I mean, down to the light bulbs, you know. I mean, all government offices were stripped of everything. So Syrian government essentially, uh, and and the sort of lackeys and flunkies and sort of magnates who um, had privatized all the stuff and really, um, 
sort of crony capitalists all took off too. So they were an incredibly advantageous situation. All the government buildings had nothing in them, but they were empty. Um, and they suddenly had the situation where they were actually able to put the things they'd been working out and discussing in theory for 20 years into effect. Um, now, at first, basically nobody noticed them. Uh, then there were several attacks from various jihadists, largely um, who seemed to have been funded, if not direct, absolutely directed by uh, the Turkish secret police. Uh, but gradually, um, the Kurdish region ended up in a conflict with ISIS. Um, ISIS, well, the origins of ISIS still remain obscure, uh, but um, it's very clear that uh, Turkish intelligence, along with various Gulf state intelligence, had a lot to do with putting them together. Uh, and they seem to have coordinated quite well um, with Turkish um, authorities of various kinds who are trading with Turkey. Um, for example, during the height of ISIS, the caliphate was openly trading oil with Turkey while the Kurdish region was under total embargo. They and couldn't Erdogan's even bring son in law was involved, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he, he was well, I believe indeed. He was the Minister of <laughs> Energy or something. Yeah. It was like openly I mean, it was, it was pretty. It's one of these situations where everyone in the region knows what's going on, but you're not allowed to say it on TV outside mm. of, um, you know, in Europe or America. I mean, they constantly find high ranking ISIS officers when they'd killed them, you know, with Turkish intelligence ID in their pockets. I mean, really blatant stuff like that. But still somehow everyone's like, how could you possibly suggest that a NATO ally is dealing with ISIS here? Um, we're all not supposed to talk about it. But um, so ISIS was just essentially acting as a Turkish proxy, was trying to um, take out the Kurdish region of North Syria to consolidate their power there and especially to you know consolidate the border with Turkey which is where they're getting their supplies they went after Kobane which is the flattest area and the easiest to attack and it turned into this epic struggle in which essentially the US was forced for various reasons to align themselves with people who are basically very close to a bunch of anarchists mm. it's a very weird historical situation um but they were caught in the middle, and eventually an alliance of convenience followed. I always emphasize this was a military alliance and not a political alliance. Uh, for example, uh, the American government has never supported Rojava being part of the peace process in Syria. Um, they don't have a place at the table at all, even though these tiny little political parties basically represent nobody on the ground do. Russia actually supports Rojava being in the peace process, and America mm. doesn't. Most people don't know that. Um, there was a military alliance simply because they both have the same enemy. Um, and as a result, there have been certain attachments that particularly personal attachments you know a lot of the americans who were down there ended up feeling well these guys are our friends are the only people who we could actually trust and 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 feel very strongly that they shouldn't be thrown to the wolves there's also a practical matter a lot of the american officers say well, look, if we ally with someone and then allow them to be completely wiped out the moment they're no longer convenient to us by our own allies, well, no one's ever going to ally with us again. 